Welcome to the show, Ryan. It's such a pleasure to have you on the Change Alchemist podcast. Thanks for having me. Of course. Ryan, I thought we could talk about your career and maybe a little bit about your origin story, how you got started and what got you motivated to get into robotics. Of course. So in terms of what got me started, I would say the same as most others, which would be a combination of watching Star Wars and Star Trek as a kid. And then also obviously very interested in space, for example, and seeing Canada's participation with the Canada arm on the, in the space program. And that was always very exciting. And at some point, at some point I found out about this mechatronics engineering program at the University of Waterloo, which was really new at that point and decided to, to give it a shot. It was close enough, close enough that I didn't have to move too far away from my house, but far enough that I didn't think I'd have to go home for dinner every weekend. And uh, the co-op program is also really interesting. Over, over that time, I'd spent a bunch of time in, in different businesses. And in terms of autonomous vehicles, the autonomous mobile robot space where I am right now, I started and had a large part in growing the UW robotics team and also did some co-ops at some early companies are, who are now known as pioneers. Kiva Systems, which is now Amazon Robotics, I still have their. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, yeah, I still have their the robots dress balls around here, as well as I also worked at Arion, which is a, a drone company uh, working on drones for search and rescue. And around around that time, myself and a few others were talking about this massive potential and how robotics and mobile robots. We're still seeing it as a bit science fiction, but there were, I guess, from a business perspective, you would say leading indicators that they were going to be ready for the world and that more and more companies were going to need them. And none of us were really patient enough to go into business for 10 years or 20 years and learn about a specific factor of business and then build a robot for that. So we just decided to try to build robots for everybody. And that's where ClearPath Robotics was born, was just to build robots for researchers, no matter if they were academic or government or corporate, and uh, to help them out really, to let them focus on what they do best. And five or six years into that, we saw this big pattern, this demand for autonomous mobile robots in factories. Obviously by that point, Kiva had been acquired by Amazon and a number of other success stories had seen it, or had, had, had seen their way through, but there was still this need to deploy robots in more complex environments that were nevertheless indoors, like the dull, dirty, dangerous of moving auto parts around a car factory, for example. And that's been going for a few years and here we are right now. That's, that's fantastic. Ryan, um, given that so much about robotics and the field is so vast and it means different things to different people. We've all grown up on a steady diet of Star Wars and Blade Runner and science fiction <laughs> books. We're familiar with robots to some extent. However, I think robotics is a vast field and I'd like to have you give us a quick primer on what robotics is, what it does and why it matters. Of course. And it's probably no surprise that if you ask, you know, five roboticists or AI experts what robotics is, you'll get 10 different answers. But generally, a straightforward way to look at it is that it's a device which can perceive the environment, can have a degree of reasoning about the environment, and then can act on a, the environment outside of itself. So for example, there's a lot of the properties of a robot are also found in a dishwasher or in a toaster oven, but they're really not affecting the environment outside of themselves but a self-driving car is driving around the world or a robot manipulator arm is changing and altering the environment or a drone is flying through the air and taking pictures. And that's, I, I think has been a, it's a, fairly, it's a fairly reasonable and consistent definition. And I can say that in most cases, the movies, so to speak, don't have it, they're not too far off. 
In fact, what they do miss is the robots that don't necessarily look like robots. There's yes. a lot more robots out in the world and which will be out in the world soon that look like look like R2-D2, for example, than, let's say, uh, Commander Data from Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned with a robot, it needs to sense the external world and have some idea of what's happening in order to communicate. So that means it could be hardware or software. Yes, yes. And there's... There's historical accounts, if you will, of robots going back centuries to various sorts of clockwork mechanisms and springs where they act only on hardware. Or to, they reason, if you will, in a very simplistic way, mechanically. And even now there have been conversations about having mechanical clockwork robots operate on the surface of Venus because it's very hard to make, it's very hard to make a electronics, which are rated to the atmosphere or to the temperature of the, of the atmosphere. You mentioned that you were interested in robot, robots and robotics from a young age. Obviously, yes. you've seen a lot of change. And what was the tipping point? What has constituted the perfect storm and the perfect market momentum for your company and for other companies to thrive? Because for computing, it's been Moore's law and there's been other things, but for robotics, what's been that silver bullet? I think the silver bullet is, is a lot of these things coming together, right? Moore's law has certainly helped, um, but at the same token, this drive for, for portable devices like these, the, the massive adoption of smartphones means that the, some of the sensors in the smartphone used to cost multiple thousands of dollars per sensor when we were just getting started. And now that's become hundreds of dollars or tens of dollars and now even dollars and cents. And that's been a massive push. Likewise for mobile devices in general and even electric cars have meant that motors are becoming more compact and more powerful and more accurate and battery packs are getting more compact. So where you saw in, in the, uh, the late, the end of the, I guess, the first decade of the, the millennium, the uh, 2008, 2009, you'd see these Boston Dynamics robots and they're all hydraulically powered, which was loud and difficult to control and put a lot of challenges. But now because of the rapid drivers in, you know, server uh, servo motors and motor controllers and electric charging and electric storage systems we're now able to pack that sort of thing into a much quieter much safer much smaller chassis so this technology commoditization and just i think overall acceptance of robots as things that can help us in our lives yeah it's definitely and as well and now what we're seeing is now there are new benefits being had from these progress in deep learning and neural networks and modern artificial intelligence techniques. For a very long time, those haven't been applied to robots which are operating without human supervision. But now, like only now in the last, in the last few years has that become possible. I think the next, uh, the next few years will be quite exciting as all of these benefits which people have been able to see from, we'll just say more standstill operations can now be put into the real world in a safe way. Um, Ryan, you mentioned ClearPath started as a general purpose um, robotics company. What has been the evolution of your company? I'd love to hear what you started out with and where you are now and what's the promise of your company? Yes, of course. Originally, ClearPath Robotics started really focused on academic research and some corporate researchers, because that's, those are the only people who really cared about it. And at the same time, we really focused on hardware. Now that the robot operating system, the open source robot operating system has grown so significantly and these basic capabilities, it's now possible to get basic algorithms that operate in the real world, we'll just say good enough, now you have people who are actually working to build applications 
on our vehicles. They may not be perfect quite yet, but they're able to quickly work with us to do more than invent a new algorithm. They're able to actually work out if a robot will, how a robot may work on a farm, for example, or in a mine, or most recently we had a local company who worked with our, our off the shelf hardware and software to build an autonomous disinfection system. Oh, wow. Uh, ultraviolet disinfection system. They, they had no, they have no robotics engineers on staff and nevertheless, they're able to take a project, a product from concept to beta launch inside of six months. And that is approaching the speed of software development. And yeah. that's, that's really quite exciting. So then your robots can actually perform different things depending on the needs of that market, whether it's COVID um, related disinfectation or maybe, maybe farming that could be, a, would, it, would, they, would it be able to actually pick tea leaves, for example, from like a tea plant? We focus on the, the mobility aspect, so mm -hmm. the, the, the driving around oh. the environment. We have partnered with other companies who focus on the manipulation aspect, which is the actual physical handling and, and picking. Okay. But I have seen researchers, I have seen researchers do things like autonomous or self-driving pollination, for instance, Very like, interesting. Uh, for fertilizing plants and because really a lot of these dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs that we rely on as a world, all it is, is you know, about a billion people on earth every day, they move from point A to point B and they pick things up and put them down or put them together. And we've, we're really working to make this move from point A to point B topic, sorry, just completely solved. And from there, there are, dozens if not hundreds of other companies who are also working out specifically on the how do I pick and how do I assemble for example and when all of these companies are starting to work together it's getting really quite exciting. But it's really exciting. So you talked about dull, dangerous and uh, dirty jobs right? And dirty which jobs, is, yeah. Which you're trying to automate and I think you had mentioned in one of your talks that one in seven workers are doing manual labor, which they shouldn't be. They're better uh, suited maybe to do something more meaningful with their lives. However, there will be some displacement with automation. And this is not, this is something that's being debated in all circles. What are your thoughts on that topic as jobs get displaced? How do you see how do you see these people getting upskilled and reskilled? Well, and I think there's two parts of that great question, which sometimes get confused. The first is, what does the world look like in the long term? And the second is, are there shocks to the system which may harm communities or harm families or harm individuals? And I think over time, we've seen that work, like what people do every day, certainly changes, right? Over, over the millennia, it's changed. I think I, I saw some statistics a while back, which unfortunately I can't cite offhand, but it was something like 95% of people's time was spent just farming. Oh. And now I believe the number is somewhere like 2%. Now we found other ways to take up our time <laughs> and we found other ways to get paid for our time. My job would not exist in this format 20 years ago, this, my job would just not be here. And, but I think the thing which is really what we should be ta talking more about is not will the jobs exist or will we find ways to compensate each other for it? It is, what about the short term? Because traditionally it's taken a long time for a type of job to go obsolete. But now with the possibilities of robotics, of AI, and with the modern manufacturing backing it up, we can have things like obsolete, hypothetically, 4 million truck drivers inside of 20 years. So we, I'm pretty sure no one's going to, not a lot of people are considering going into trucking as much as they did 20 years ago. But what about the people who made that decision 10 years ago? They're not going to be anywhere near, near retired. And then I think there, there is a second question, which is much less for the the, the roboticists as much as it is for 
general society to answer is, does this lead to greater and greater wealth concentration, for example? I actually don't think it, it will as much because I think it has a chance to actually empower small and medium-sized businesses and family businesses. I think robotics can actually really empower this. But I think there are transients or shocks in the system that need to be help filtered and help smoothed over. And maybe the last thing I'd say on this topic is that this is not a problem that we should just solve just because of robotics and what, what people like me do. I think it's also a problem which, which already exists. Like there are a lot of people who choose their career at 18 years old and that's what they do for 40 plus years. And robotics causes similar problems, but it, it actually goes beyond robotics into general, who do, who do we want to be as a society? Ryan, it's interesting that work is being disrupted as we speak for a variety of reasons. We live in an exponential world. That's one thing. The other thing is with COVID, I think we've seen large shifts in the way we work. We've seen untethering both physical and social. But there's another factor, which I think is that work as we knew it is changing. Everybody's going to have two or three careers in their lifetime. I spoke to a gentleman, Jeff Schwartz, who's the Deloitte Future of Work um, practice lead. And he thinks that you can't have the same job for 40 years like your grandfather did. Our kids, my daughter for sure, will have maybe five or six experiences. So maybe that's a better way to reframe um, this problem. In the short term, yes, it's a problem. But in the long term, it could mean experiences and different things you learn over a lifetime, as opposed to doing the same menial uh, drudgery work for 40 years, which a lot of people were resigned to doing, I think. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that what we need to do as a society is we need to look at this, this increased pace of an automation revolution and look at it to say, how do we support these people? Because there's always been people who've been able to comfortably transition through careers as their whims took them. But by and large, the majority of people are not able to, they're not able to do, that. they need to support themselves. They need to support their family and, and extended and, and direct family. And I think you're right that there is a, an immense possibility here and it's, it's not a bad thing. It just depends on, on how we support people through these transitions. Yeah. You brought up some excellent points about supporting people and being aware of the short-term shocks and implications. And I know I live in Silicon Valley and it's all about, I think, the latest technology du jour. So Elon Musk, for example, has been a de facto leading a voice of AI and robotics and has made dire predictions and doomsday uh, scenarios. For example, he's claimed that your self-driving car will tell you, uh, will take you where you want to go and you don't even have to tell it where it needs to go. So I know there's so much hype around self-driving cars and a lot of money has gone into it for sure. But we're not solving more fundamental problems. I'd love to get your thoughts on this and shine a light on what kinds of problems we should be solving. Yes, self-driving cars is, a, is an interesting topic. I think fundamentally, as much as I like robots, obviously, I was doing it before it was cool, so to speak. The self-driving cars, I have two problems with that. I think the first fundamental problem is it really valuable to make my drive to, I don't know, to pick up a pizza more comfortable than the people who are actually like honestly hurting themselves every day to, to do work, right? Short of, short of the truck drivers, is it really a good thing for society if we focus our limited resources and time on solving the problem for the haves, so to speak? 
The other is, is actually from a fundamental engineering and product development perspective. It's jumping all the way to self-driving cars is a really hard problem. It's a really significant leap and it can help all sorts of other fields. I myself am very thankful for the money that has gone into self-driving cars because we've been able to draw on it. But it's like going from the Wright brothers all the way to the Apollo mission. Like they are fundamentally similar technologies and similar things you learn along the way, but there's some easier midpoints that you don't have to make that help you. And in particular, help society. For example, every piece of technology that we build is equally applicable to self-driving cars. It's just that we pick the simpler problem space. The problem space is still worth billions or trillions of dollars per year, but it's, it's a little bit simpler. We don't have to deal with pedestrians, with the general public. We don't need to deal with a mess of, a mess of national regulations. We don't have to deal with the rain and the snow and all of these things. We don't have to deal with as much of as complex traffic. And I can see that we're still driving tens of thousands of hours autonomously without safety drivers um, every month. And that's helping progress the industry. And that's I think there's other ways we can solve problems with our, which are first more fundamental and more honestly, I think valuable to society. And also that help us eventually get to the self-driving cars and the self-driving sidewalk delivery robots and, and what have you. I would like to pivot the conversation a little bit to a topic that's, I think, important as we bring AI into robotics and have AI actually enter our worlds. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about ethics in AI and why that's important and how we can enforce that. Oh, oh, ethics in AI, also an interesting topic. I think, so first and foremost, I would say that the for anyone who's connecting the ethics in AI topic with the self-driving cars topic, the trolley problem was always meant as a experiment who was never meant to have anything to do with cars or robots. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I think we've all, we've like all heard of that. Are, yes. <laughs> we, we have all heard of the trolley problem. And if, if you haven't heard of the tro trolley problem, please don't look it up at this point. But it's something which takes away from some of the, the deeper ethical questions around AI and things like, uh, things like inclusion is, a, is a always, all, obviously a big topic. It, there's things like my my wife and I, for example, have very different reactions, or, or sorry, not different reactions, but Amazon, the Amazon um, Alexa home assistants work way better for me than they do for her. And is this because of some quirk of my voice, or is it because of a, an actual like training and design aspect? Um, and I, so there's an inclusion topic. There's privacy topics, obviously. There's also a deeper question, both. Um, it, which becomes most prevalent in military contexts, but also becomes important in, in policing or public service or honestly just basic customer support, which is RP is a, is a robot or is a um, artificial agent making decisions which may affect you. Is someone making an important decision that might affect you in your life without you either knowing that there's no person making this decision or without being able to get in touch with a person? This is a, the most extreme example, this is a debate I've been part of for um, many years now on autonomous weapon systems, but on the least extreme example, you have people having their, their apps automatically rejected from the app store, for example, or you know, their YouTube, YouTube or what have you videos being automatically removed with no recourse. And I think that's a very important topic from an AI ethics perspective as well. Excellent. So in terms of moving to the next stage of robotics, do you think COVID's played a part? I heard about a company called Cloud Minds in Wuhan that actually had a robot-assisted wing of the hospital. Sophia has become popular again, the first robot to have Saudi citizenship, I think. 
when we look at the future of robotics, do you think existentially that we, we might have a crisis? Do you think humanoid robots could be uh, could have consciousness, for example? And I guess there's some ethics that plays into this question, but do you think that's a distinct possibility? I would say not anytime soon. Okay. Like that, there is an interesting concept which branches into the, the research fields of artificial general intelligence. It branches into a lot, well, frankly, a lot of research of philosophic, um, sorry, philosophy and, and psychology and even, even biology, for instance. Like, what does it mean to have consciousness and to have sentience? What I do think, though, is very interesting in the short term is that you can have, you can start to explore aspects of the human condition which weren't possible before. For example, for example, I'm someone who's quite skilled in robotics and quite comfortable and experienced around them. And I've, I've, I've had a bunch of time using a Boston Dynamics spot because we have one at the office or still have one at the office somewhere around. So I've had one around and I still find it creepy. And I'm, I've over a decade of daily experience with this technology. And for some reason, I find spot creepy. And I'm not sure why, but it, you'd think that it might actually, it, it may actually help us discover things about who we are as, as humans. Oh, I didn't think that. So explain what this bot does. What does it do, the, the Boston uh, Dynamics robot? It's a, it's a fairly, you can, it's a fairly popular, popular robot stunt, or not stunt video, uh, sorry, popular robot on YouTube these days. It's a four-legged robot where uh, they've got about a thousand of them out in the world. And it, they're working on various ways to, or they're working on various applications for things like remote inspection and public, public service and what have you. And I have, and, and we're a partner with them. We help support them with the research community. And this is only one of, I don't know, two or three or four dozen different kinds of distinct robots I've driven. And we have them around. And there are um, studies we do, for example, and we've done some research with a prof at, at Oregon State, Heather Knight, specifically on, on human robot interaction for robots that are just like R2D2, so to speak. Like they have no face, they have no arms, but they can still express a personality, or you still think they do. But the there are other robots which which are which which you have a, a little bit more of a visceral reaction to, and I think all of these things are really interesting. Like, why do you why do people name why do people name our robots? Mm -hmm. We ship robots to most of our or most of our customers name our robots. Oh, really? We never tell them to name the robots. We do <laughs> not suggest that they name the robots, and they still name the robots. They don't name the forklifts, but they name the robots. And I think there's a lot of deep questions here about why and that why, what is the relationship of, of humans with technology? And also why do people feel the urge to name like a metric ton of, of steel and wires? <laughs> it's not flesh and blood. Yes. <laughs> it, it's really not. Yeah. I know that some people have, like Tom Malone, uh, who's a professor at MIT, has said that humans and bots will work together and they will become super minds. So they'll work in, in tandem. So maybe that's just how we're wired. We want to we wanna connect, right? As, as humans, I think the need for connection and the need for social interaction is so strong. I don't, I wonder if that plays a part in that dynamic. Yeah, I think it very well might. I know of a few people at our company who would periodically take their kids to, to visit the robots on weekends because <laughs> our robots do 24 seven testing of all new software. And so you, you just walk into the office and there'll be a dozen robots driving around our test site. And I know some would just bring their kids by to, to visit the robots. And I think sometimes the kids might look at them as, as almost pets. <laughs> So what are the main uses for your robots? If you were to pick the top use cases, what would they be? The automotors business unit that we have is entirely around material movement 
in you know manufacturing warehouses. So you've got all sorts of different form factors, and it's about moving things from about a hundred kilos all the way up to all the way up to about two thousand kilos from point A to point B. And it's in you know, car factories, in parts factories, in healthcare manufacturing in food and beverage, all of these things. And it just thousands of kilometers every day, just robots moving stuff around so people don't have to. And then beyond that, really there's this whole spectrum of, of things that get done on the research side that people just try out with our robots. Everything from robots for automated spacecraft manufacturer, I think has come up. I think I've seen people use, train groups of robots or program groups of robots to assemble Ikea furniture, 3D printing houses using robot bases, farming, mining, remote inspection of infrastructure. And sometimes just honestly, they need a robot to help them prove a math theory. Like they're just designing, they're designing a new algorithm to map the world and they just need a robot to put a camera on. All sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of approaches. So have you crossed the chasm? Is it mainstream now that people are using robots? I would say like robots in general have crossed the chasm. If, if you say that you've got a robot vacuum or a robot lawnmower, no one's going to blink an eye. That's just the sort of thing that people get, right? The DJI drones, for example, DJI being the most common manufacturer, apologies to any other drone manufacturer on the line, but DJI makes a, these really low cost camera drones. And when I got started, these drones would cost $100,000 and we'd worked really hard to keep them from falling out of the sky and even still you needed to be an expert to use them and now you can buy them and like they're like christmas presents for some people so i think robotics in general has crossed the chasm and that makes it i think easier that when these less toy robots are starting to be around commercial floor cleaners mm -hmm. um, there's a local kitchener company avid bots which is doing great there ourselves on the, the factories and warehouses where people are just now starting to get used to this. They're starting to get used to the fact that person with a cart, person with a cart, forklift, self-driving robot, that's how our factory works. <laughs> okay. And I think right now, and what I've seen right now, particularly on the auto motors front, is that no one questions, is the robot going to work? Five years ago, it was, can it map, right? How, how does it know where it is? And is it really gonna hurt people or, or what have you? And now those are just a bunch of check boxes. We say, yes, of course it can do all that. And the real question is, is how much does it cost? When can we have it? And does it actually help me in my specific problem? So I think that's really where it is now. And we're going to see more and more of this through some other industries where you won't be asking questions like safety, for yeah. example, because it's safe. And that's, that's where we are really like the amount of, I can't remember the last time I, I needed to ask a customer or sort of answer a customer safety questions, for oh, example. Fantastic. People so, trust companies like us because we've proven it. So I know software has you huge margins, but do you, do you ever encounter price objections when you sell? Do prices keep dropping of hardware and do it, people expect low, do they pay less for um, robots or how do you keep that? How do you keep your margins? It is a challenge because we are trying to, um, we are building a lot of software from scratch and we do need to, we do want to, to, to compensate our team as, as much as we can. And a lot of this stuff is just being built from the ground up in the last few years. But generally the people we are dealing with right now, and this is actually a positive thing. They just compare us to the prices of people, they compare us to the prices of that's good. conveyors of traditional equipment. And that's actually a good sign that we are crossing the chasm because no one's buying our stuff. But the majority of people who buy our stuff don't buy it because of the science fair project. They buy it because they have very real problems Good, and they evaluate us against all these other options. And that's the positive sign is that we're only most of the time we, we talk in terms of price. Okay. That's good. You touched upon space briefly in the context of some of your robots actually doing work in that field. And I know you advise companies in, in the space tech field. Now, could you kind of give me a sense of 
your views on space tech in general and how that intersects with robotics in particular? Yeah, space is, the space is becoming immensely exciting. Like I, as much as I may disagree with, with Elon Musk and others on their push for self-driving vehicles, I will certainly give SpaceX all the credit they have for showing the way. And now you've got other companies, you've got Rocket Lab and Kepler and all sorts of other companies which are making, which are democratizing access to space, which are doing things like providing operational support, which are providing satellite constellation management or all sorts of different satellite bus creation and all these sensor creation. There's all sorts of different things you can now do now that we have a mature ecosystem. You no longer need to build a space startup. You no, no, no longer need to engineer everything from the rocket all the way up to the satellite optics. And that's, that's really exciting. And I think we're seeing a lot of, we, we're seeing a lot more use cases, like legitimate use cases, mainly around communications and data. Now, I think what we will start to see and what, what we still do rely on from a robotics perspective is more government or otherwise public sector for support for things like, for things like the lunar or lunar colonization or Mars colonization or missions or space station creation, because without that, there is a relatively limited market for robotics. You get into things like satellite refueling or automated orbit boosting, or just the actual fundamental spacecraft. But if we're looking at more robotics, one of the things I've typically talked to the companies who want to do space robotics is to find other markets on earth, which are similar. And that means they're well positioned when that market explodes. I think the launch market, for example, the communications and the data market, that's exploding in part because of things like these advances in AI means you can process all this data without having the equivalent of, of rooms full of people with magnifying glasses pouring over satellite photos. But there still is this a little bit of a lag, I think, before space robotics will be a big market on its own. Yeah. Do you see as colonizing any of the planets anytime? Do, do you well, think? Well, I think it's quite possible. <laughs> in, in our lifetimes, um, do you think? I would think so, yeah. I would believe that we'll have, that we'll have some degree of, we'll just say reasonably self-sustaining colony. I, there's no technical reason why we can't, right? There's no technical reason, but the pessimistic counterpoint is that there's no technical reason why we couldn't have had a moon base, a sizable moon base by, by the, the turn of the millennium. But I, I do think there's a lot of private sector efforts being pushed behind this. I think there may be a little bit of a, rather, I, I hope there's a resurgence, in, resurgence of nationalism around this topic because it's much better than a resurgence of nationalism around like arms races, for example. And I think there's a lot of, you know, really exciting technology out there which can support it. And I would have hated to try to engineer, engineer any kind of avionics with the computers we had in the 60s or 70s. <laughs> but now there's so much potential, right? The, the helicopter that's about to fly on Mars was built off of components that you can just buy with a credit card from, Amazing. Uh, I think they're all bought from SparkFun. <laughs> so it's huge potential, right? Yeah. It's, I think, that, like you said, it's appetite. I'm sure people are willing to go there too. Given a chance, if they have enough money, they probably will volunteer. Speaking of your own superpowers, I'd like to <laughs> talk to you a little bit about, you've had quite a few accomplishments. What would you characterize as your superpower? I'd say I just love to learn. I love to read books. I love to, and I, I love to really engage with people and, and learn from mentors. And I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of mentors that I've been able to learn from. And I think that's just generally great. I try to, if I look at it objectively, I try to optimize my days to, to learn the most, like, to learn as, as quickly as I can. And if that's the internet, 
if it's reading books, if it's if it's talking to people, just as many perspectives and, and as much information as I possibly can get. I think right at the beginning of COVID, I bought the 50 volumes of the, the Harvard Classics. Oh my um, God. Off eBay from... <laughs> Which is that, so that'll probably take me about five years to slowly crank through those along with all the other things I'm reading because that one is, uh, that, that volume was English poetry and that is not my background at all. It was like multiple engineering degrees and not very much a poetry guy, but I'm still seeing, uh, seeing what I can get from it. Okay. So you're exploring new worlds. <laughs> yes, as much as I can. <laughs> you mentioned you like to read. Is it mostly technical or is there a favorite non-technical book you loved and you'd like to talk about? In terms of, so I unsurprisingly read a lot of science fiction. Recently, I've been a fan of Alistair Reynolds on the science fiction side of things. Previous to that, I was reading a bunch of Ian Banks, actually, and I am about, I think, 98% through uh, rereading Lord of the Rings. Oh, nice. That's what I was, that's what I was reading at lunch before I came up for this. And then, then there's, yeah, then there's these, these classics books and various sorts of business and entrepreneurship. Some of it is, is more like the, the more guidance things like the hard thing about hard things or what have you. And then there's a lot of what I might call like business history. So things like, I, I really enjoyed the Skunk Works book, for instance, I think it's uh, Ben Rich, the story of Skunk Works, or there's like the, the Innovation Factory is another great book. So it's, a, it's generally a mix there. Okay. Um, is there a quote that you like to live by? Nothing is really coming to mind. Nothing <laughs> is really coming to mind. So I'm just, I think that the default answer then would be no, there, there really is. Is there a quote from a science fiction book that comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would normally, the quote that might come to mind would be, would be, do or do not there is no try and at this point <laughs> i will know for any star wars fans that i'm aware that that's not the precise wording but i thought of the same thing i thought you might like yoda's quotes <laughs> yes if there were three pieces of uh, advice you would give to our younger listeners starting out their careers in science and technology what would they be the first would be to not overfocus on your career in science and technology. It's very important to, to stay connected to people, especially with those people without different backgrounds, uh, with, with different backgrounds than science and technology or what have you. Without going into details, I can say that I, I would not be where I was if all I did was focus on science and technology. I would also say to seek mentorship and that most of the people out there, short of short of, I don't know, asking Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates personally for advice or Marissa Meyer personally for advice, short of asking people like that, like most people are willing to help. And the worst they can say is, is no, as long as you're polite. And I would say, I would say those are actually about it. I, I would just cut it off with those two. Okay. I'd like to um, leave our listeners with your view for the future of work through a robotics lens. Love your thoughts on that topic. I think, so I would say I, I fundamentally believe that manual labor can be, like repetitive manual labor can be a thing of the past. And it can be a thing of the past very quickly in years or decades, not centuries. And it just takes an appreciation for I think for appreciation for the work that is involved in manual labor and a, and also an engagement with the rest of the world, because we don't want to make it a thing of the past and have the world that is replaced to be a uh, much less, a much less um, positive one. Thank you. And where can people connect with you? Where can, where can they find information about your company? They can, uh, they can connect with me on, on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. And um, my email is ryan at clearpath.ai. And those are usually the, uh, those are the best ways to connect with me. As for the company, it's clearpathrobotics.com and automotors.com. That's O-T-T-O motors.com. 
Thank you, Ryan. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you.